so much for joining us. We are live with uh, Safras Manzor as part of South Asian Heritage Month's literary program. And we will be discussing his fantastic book, They, which I highly recommend that you read. My name is Natasha Janejo, and I am literary lead over at South Asian Heritage Month and founder of South Asian Writers. Safras, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for joining us. Um, that's uh, it's good to be with you. I'll just sort of say to everybody, hi, whoever's out there. Uh, this is my literally my first event to do with the book, so um, I might be a little bit rusty, but then at the same time, uh, you're getting it, you're getting it fresh. So, uh, so there's an advantage in that at least. Um, well, I feel very honoured that we're your that we're your first event. Um, so, when when is uh, the launch for this book? Um, the book's coming out on Thursday, uh, that which is. It's going to be serialized in the Sunday Times magazine tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. But the bit they're focusing on is is quite a memoirish bit. And the book isn't really just a memoir. So in a sense, it's a slightly, um, you know, it's a slightly narrow focus on it. And then the book actually comes out um, on Thursday, the 19th. Smashing. So when you say that it's not necessarily a memoir, for, for readers out there that don't know much about this book, so if I read the full title for you, my apologies. So it's called They, What Muslims and Non-Muslims Get Wrong About Each Other. So if I, I think my first question actually would be, what was the impetus behind writing this book? Well, put it this way, my first book, or my only other book, came out in 2007. Uh, it was called Greetings from Berry Park, and it was it was a memoir of growing up in Luton in the 80s and having my life transformed by Bruce Springsteen. And that came out, and then I spent a long time working on the script to turn that into a film called Blinded by the Light, uh, which came out in 2019. And during, since 2007, you know, every so often somebody might say, have you got another new book? Are you, what are you working on? And I never really had an answer for them, to be honest, because mm -hmm. I, I always felt that, you know, there are stories, that, uh, there are books that you want to write, and then there are books that you need to write. And because of the fact that I've got so much else going on in my life, not least get it, having, having a wife and two children and all this other stuff, it just wanting to write something wasn't important enough for me. It just wouldn't cross the hurdle. It had to be something that I needed to write. And I just never needed to write anything. And really what changed that was pretty much 2016. So around about in 2016, um, you might remember, it had there was a, quite a lot of things that happened. You had the Manchester Arena attack. You had London Bridge. You had Westminster Bridge. Um, the following year in 2017, we just were near where I lived. There was the Finsbury Park attack. And, I, and then you also had Thomas Mayer uh, murdering Joe Cox. You had all these things going on. You had Brexit you had Donald Trump. And this narrative started getting traction, which is that there is this sort of absolute tension and conflict between Muslims and non-Muslims, that they, they just have different values. Rochdale, Telford, all that stuff, the, the CSE stuff. Mm. And I started taking this really personally because I just started thinking I've always been generally quite a hopeful, optimistic kind of person. I just kind of feel like basically people are decent, basically people are tolerant, don't believe the stuff you see on social media, Twitter isn't the real world. That's been my general take on things. But then you started seeing this hostility. You started seeing the rise of the EDL and Britain first. I started thinking, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the, the country that I think is so nice and pleasant and tolerant isn't, you know? And then I had skin in this game, not only because I am from a Pakistani Muslim heritage, but because I'm married to somebody who is white and Scottish and from a Christian, nominally Christian background. I've got two children who are of mixed faith and mixed race, and, and they're quite young. Uh, one's just turned 10 and the other one's four. But a few years ago, they were even littler. And I just started getting really stressed by the idea that they would start growing up believing that there was something inherently problematic about one side of their heritage and something mm. inherently benign and positive about the other side. And so I just thought, is there anything that I can do to help? You know, and I think it was around about Westminster Bridge or something when I was on, I, I saw on Twitter, somebody tweeted this quote from Fred Rogers, the American children's television presenter. And, and this quote was something like, whenever, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Mm. And I, and I just thought the media never focuses on that. 
you know, they'll focus on the guy who blows up Manchester Arena, but they won't focus on the Muslim surgeon who helps the people who are the victims, you know? Absolutely. And I just thought, well, what do I do? What am I good at? I'm not a politician. I'm not a leader. I'm not somebody, I don't run an organization. I've got a pretty limited set, set of skills. I can tell, I'm a storyteller, I'm a journalist. So I just thought, well, why don't I try and see if I can find the helpers and try and tell a story that is trying to look for hope in a time of hopelessness. And so that's mm. really where it came from. I wanted to write a book that was completely clear-eyed. So there's no sense that one isn't looking at some of the hardest questions facing Muslims and non-Muslims. You know, I don't duck anything. But at the same time, rather than a book which basically then says, well, we're all screwed, I wanted to write a book that was going to be hopeful. So, so, the, so the simple answer is the impetus was having kids and having lived through a series of events which made me question whether the narrative about Muslims and non-Muslims was inevitably one of conflict and wanting to do something in my own way that would help that. Mm. That's really beautifully put, thank you. And I think that's the thing as well, like it, it, in the reading of it, it is so extensively researched so extensively researched and the way that you lay it out as well for the reader you have they don't marry outside of their own faith and then you've got the next chapter they don't treat men and women as equals they don't follow they follow a violent religion they follow a religion that 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 dislikes jewish people and so on and so forth and it literally is and what i love about it is that you have have researched each of these issues you have interviewed um people from the communities that have um personal stories and experiences that relate that are pertinent to each of these issues and then you weave in your own life experience as well and it really is such an extraordinary extraordinary read so Thank you. when you <laughs> you're very welcome when you were when you were researching the personal side of it in terms of the human interest stories for each chapter how did you what did that process look like how did you go about that what did you employ all of your journalistic uh, background there because i in the reading of this i was i remember saying to a friend of mine i was just like it really helps that he's a journalist like it's really helping me get through this i love it you laid it out so so beautifully yeah well you know it's interesting because i think there are certain books which are in this sort of territory where somebody writes something on page one and you kind of get the sense that by page 280, they'll have not really changed their mind, that it's essentially mm. a polemic, you know? Um, and then you have other books which are basically people just telling you what to do. You know, the uh, this is what you need to be an ally or this is what you need to be an anti-racist. I, I find most of those books deeply annoying and irritating. I'm not really into any of that stuff because... I wanted to write something which was about lived experience. Mm. And so in a way, you know, what was interesting was writing or help but, but working on the on, on the on blinded by the light was actually really interesting about that because <laughs> when I was start when I was starting to think about writing the book, there was a part of me that thought I was going to maybe try and do something which was a little bit more manifesto-ish, you know, mm. where how do you solve the problem off? Dot dot dot. How do you solve the problem off? Whatever. And then what was interesting about Blinded by the Light is that this film came out and then I went to the States, it was about two years ago this month, in fact, and did a tour and went to all these cities around the, uh, around America showing this film. And the film is about Luton in 1987, which is not necessarily, you know, a universal space and time for people. Do you know what I mean? And there's a Pakistani Muslim working class family. And the number of people who I would reach, who would contact me, and they still do. I mean, there is barely a day that goes by when somebody doesn't contact me on Twitter or Instagram from somewhere in the world to say that they've just seen Blinded by the Light and it connected with them. Mm. And I was like, how is it connect with you? You're not a 16-year-old Pakistani kid in 1987. You're in <laughs> Mexico. You're in Mexico. What, what's, what's this got to do with you? you know? And the, obviously what it's about is storytelling and universal themes. Mm. And I just thought, you know what, that's what I'm going to do with this book. I'm going to basically mix the journalism that you've just talked about with storytelling. And so mm. where the journalism comes in is, in a way, the journalism comes in by saying, I'm going to tell the story that's unusual. You know, so basically, pretty much every story in this book doesn't quite go the way you think it will. Pretty much most of them don't. They seem mm. to. Some of them might start as in like, oh, yeah, here's a story of oppression or here's a story about a woman who won't send her children to university or whatever. There's usually a twist somewhere. 
And so the journalistic antennae, I think, is about tell me something that's surprising. Tell me something that's interesting. Tell me something I don't know. You know how I found those people. Well, that is the stuff that that's why the book took, took, you know, took a couple of years, because some of it was about just digging into the archives. Some of it was asking people who knew people who might know people. Some of it was Twitter, actually, I, hilariously. So, for example, I, I read that, you know, basically the, the book is does it is told thematically through these different my idea was if I was to have a conversation with somebody who was a bit dodgy about Islam and I said to them, what do you think Muslims are like? What would they say? And I'd say they probably say they don't want to marry. They only marry each other. They don't want to live amongst themselves. They hate Jews. They hate women. So mm. I just wrote all these things down and I thought I'm just going to tackle all of them. But then it's also linear. So the first chapter starts with the men, largely the men who arrive in Britain in the late 50s, early 60s. And it sets that world up. And then their wives come and then they have kids. And then the kids go through different issues, whether it's to do with marriage, etc. So there is a sort of a linear story. Now, a lot of the people from the subcontinent who came to Britain came up to 1962, late 50s, 1960, up to 61, 62. And 1962 was also the year when the Pakistan cricket team arrived to play a test series. And I just thought, isn't that weird? You've got all these people who've just left Pakistan seemingly forever. They rock up to London. And sub, uh, to, to London, to Manchester, to Birmingham, and then their Pakistan cricket team is there. I thought, how crazy <laughs> would it be? Then I thought, I wonder if there's anybody who was there now, who's around now, who might have seen Pakistan play cricket. So I literally mm. just tweet, tweeted that. I just said, is there anybody who follows me who was at England versus Pakistan at Lords in 1962? And someone responded and said, my dad was. <laughs> That's amazing. That's and amazing. So, and so they're in the book. So it, I use all sorts of different things. The other thing is, you know, um, my, my journalism career is now, I, I started at ITN in September 1996. So it's 25 mm -hmm. years next month. So in that time, I've done a lot of writing and a lot of it has been about identity and issues and, and Islam and belonging. And so there is sort of, I've got, I've got enough of a track record that if I now want to speak to someone who hasn't ever spoken before, who, who might be nervous, I don't really have to blag it. They can just look me up and they'll see that I'm not going to do them in. You know, a mm. good example is Fazila Aswat, who, you know, she was the woman, who, she was uh, Joe Cox's personal assistant. She was the woman in whose arms Joe Cox died. Right. And oh she's never goodness. really, she's never spoken before. You know, she's never done a long form interview before. And she mm. was kind enough to talk to me. But part of the reason I think is because, you know, when you've been around and you can see that I'm not going to, you know, my agenda is that is not one that's been that's malicious or malevolent. Then there's a certain level of trust that comes in. So I think that helped as well. Um, so it's journalism, storytelling, having been around enough and then a desire to try and tell stories that would sort of challenge people's preconceptions. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think that was so well put. And it's it's one of the things as well. And I think there's a great deal of trepidation when you are asking people to comment on their community. And when you are asking people to comment on some of the more barbed and fractious elements or controversial elements of their community. And what I loved about this is that you don't rubbish who we are and 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 what we are. And it very much is interwoven with the personal stories about family and and the fact that this is ultimately as well a love letter to your father um it is is it's it's such a beautiful interweaving of all of that amidst all of the addressing a lot of fears that other people have as well and the the interplay of them both at the same time it's a, it's an extraordinary thing and it's very 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 difficult to do is that something that you deliberately set out to, to have in parallel with one another? Or is that something that in accessing all of these very difficult aspects and facets of, of our identity or Muslim and Pakistani identity, that these things just came to the surface as, as sort of em emblems of, but this is why I love it, you know, as, as, a, protective, um, as a protective device? I think, um, oh, there's two things about this. One is I think I'm a bit older now than I was, uh, aren't we all? But I think 
one of the things that happens, I'd recently turned 50, it was a deeply traumatizing experience, but one of the things that I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I've got now that I didn't have before is I just don't feel arrogant enough to think that I know it all. Mm. I don't, I just don't feel so secure to know that I am actually right about the things that I might think, you know? Um, so if I had written, and in fact, I did write a book in my early 30s, but if I wrote a book in my teenage years about my dad, the way I would have represented or thought about him is going to be different than, than now because I've got more empathy for that generation than mm -hmm. I would have had when I was a teen or in my 20s. You know, So I think part of it is just realizing that one should be arrogant enough to think that one is right. You know, it's just, this is how you see the world. We're all creatures of our time, our product of our ages, the way we were brought up. So some of it is just, well, you know, this is what I think, but well, maybe I'm wrong. That's part of it. Second part is I really wanted to be as hard on myself and my own preconceptions as I was on anyone else's, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example of that. One of the toughest ones, really, in a way, is, you know, my, I, I had a difficult story with my relationship with my wife in terms of my family were not very happy about it. And, uh, you know, my, my siblings, my one sister turned up, my other siblings didn't turn up to my own wedding. And, you know, cut a long story short, that is a really, really difficult thing to, to experience, to think about, etc. But when I write about it, and when I thought about writing about it, it would be too easy to use that and then sort of make it a power game about me expressing all my anger and being upset mm. and stuff the harder thing to do is to try and have empathy for the sort of person who might decide that they can't turn up to their son or their brothers or their sister's wedding and think mm. what's the journey that would lead them to have that opinion you know and so for me the book was partly about trying to have empathy for people whose journeys and views may not be what i have or what what i believe but to try and say, well, why would they see that the world that way, you know? And to not assume that people whose views I don't agree with are necessarily bad people or bad guys, you know? Just to have a generous sense of empathy towards people. So that's something which I was trying to weave through, whether it's with somebody who joins the EDL or whether it's somebody who doesn't turn up, turn up to my wedding, you know? Mm. It's about trying to have empathy for the different and for the person who you might not necessarily, whose views you might not necessarily agree with. And that's extraordinarily difficult to do, especially when you're writing from the personal and something that has affected you. And I wonder whether it was quite cathartic in that sense of revisiting those experiences, but then having to place yourself in the shoes of, of somebody that is conflicted in that sense. And, and, and often we don't do that when we, when we explore those things through memory and it will only ever be through the writing of it. I'd like to say, it was, I'd like to tell you it was cathartic. I don't think it really <laughs> I'm feeling pretty rough even talking to you about it now. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. No, I'm not really, but no, I think, uh, no, it wasn't really cathartic, but I think what it was is my whole thing is that, um, the more granular you get, the more universal you get. Mm. So my thing was, you know, yes, I am talking about my experiences in the book. The book, it, there, there is, it's not a memoir, but my feelings about things and my stories and experiences are weaved through. The only reason they're weaved through is not really self-indulgence. It's really because they hopefully illuminate bigger points, you know, bigger points about love, about the ties that bind, about family, about how sometimes the journey might, the journey of progress might involve some pain. Those are big universal questions. But the only way that um, what I wanted to do was to humanize those questions. And throughout the book, you know, the, there are big questions about segregation, about the rights of women, about minorities, about violence, about the textual analysis of religion. But this book is not a book about any of those things, really. It's about individuals who are caught up and have certain choices that they can make, and some who choose to go one direction and some who choose to go to the other. Mm -hmm and the impacts of that. So it's all about lived experience. And, you know, whether you're writing a screenplay, whether you're writing a novel, which I've not done, whether you're writing a play, whether you're writing good journalism, it's about having complexity of character, isn't it? And the complexity Absolutely. of character means 
don't make the good guy only good and don't make the bad guy only bad. Exactly. Because even the bad guy believes that he is doing everything for the right reason. He believes he's right. And and being able to empathize in that way is absolutely key. And I have a note here saying it's deeply humanizing. And you said that too. And, and that's exactly what it is. And I think it's so necessary when we're dealing with quite fractious and contentious issues with actually when, when actually if you're sitting within that community it's not that contentious because we understand all of the the complex layers that that are that are at play at one time and and we obviously see the humanity at every level but when you are viewing muslims as a monolith from the outside you don't see all of this and i think work like this is so 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 important and and i'm so grateful for all of these you have the, the the stories that you weave in from people that you've spoken to, but the fact that you weave in your personal experiences, the fact that you are laying bare so much vulnerability in this, and it really is so much vulnerability, it 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 makes it rather beautiful. It is something that that is a commentary. It is social commentary. It is something that is an education. It's very well researched. There is a it, that there's almost case studies in there from people that are, that have gone through similar experiences, but the human element of you laying open things that have happened in your life and the journey that you have gone through with your family and with your personal experiences, for me, m completes the circle of of what this is, and and it makes it it takes it from something that was that was great to extraordinary in my eyes because it it, it deeply humanizes and contextualizes this experience and if you are viewing um this this religion as a monolith and after you read this i just don't think i think that it will alter your worldview exponentially i mean i think part of it was like i'm i'm quite mod not modest is probably the wrong word i'm quite nervous about saying too much about the book for my for myself because i just feel mm. like all I literally tried to do was to try and do some good. Mm. That's if 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 I can just feel like I was a helper, if I've just felt like I can add to the conversation, I don't feel like it's the end of the conversation. I don't think no, this no, is the, of the manifesto that solves everything. But <laughs> I just feel like if I can move the dial a little bit, make people. I think um, uh, James O'Brien had a quote where he said, "You know, I finished the book with uh, with more knowledge, more understanding, and more hope." That's mm. basically all I tried to do, really. Um, and, and then, you know, the thing is, I started by talking about my kids. And that's not just a line. It really is that. It is about them, you know, for me. And the, the, the reason it's so personal is because, as I said, there are things that you need to do and the things you want to do. This is a book that I really needed to write. And what's really interesting is, it's also really interesting about how I'm feeling commercially about things and stuff, you know, because, like... I really, really feel like there are there are different metrics of success, aren't there? Like, you know, does a book sell well? Does it get good reviews? All that sort of stuff. And I feel really at peace about that stuff more than I would do because I just feel like, you know what? I know I've done some good with this book. I just feel like I have, you know, because I haven't lied. It's completely true to me. The voice in this book is me, you know, and I've not ducked the issues and I've done the best I can. And I think in its own small way, I think it is a useful contribution. And it's, a really and it's a really lovely feeling to think, you know what, I actually am not so fussed about the rest of it because I think it will last. And I think people will come to it at different times if they need answers. And so there's something quite nice about not feeling so worried about overhyping it in my own head. I just feel like, you know what, th there is a reason this book I feel deserves a place to exist. Not every book necessarily deserves yeah. to exist. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, we're not the book police, everyone. No. So <laughs> I feel like, yeah. So in that sense, yeah. And I think the the other it's thing, its own reward, isn't it? In that sense, and it, the the satisfaction comes from the the creation of it. And yeah. it reminds me a great deal of Empire Land by Satnam Sangera, and they are yeah. they they 
the the goal is to achieve very different things but they yeah. are they sit within a very similar uh, sensibility whereby they are going to they are just a resource and but the, but they are so steeped in there is there is tender human and humorous lovely moments in there that humanize this experience and bring bring all of the the intelligent discourse around what we are saying right back down to the heart, bones and marrow of people and oh. and that's what these two books for me i'm pointing at it because it's right there but that's what these two books for me do so so effectively and so well and like you say um and i think that's possibly where that feeling comes from like it's out that it's it's out of me it is out there now and it it will just do what it does and, and the satisfaction is in the making of it and then the fact that it is in the world and also, I think the other thing is that, you know, I think the, the, the link with Empire Land is also, I guess, the fact that this, this is a story that people think they know, mm. but it's more complex than that. You know, yes, the, story yeah. of, the story of Empire is more complicated. The story of Muslims is more complicated. It's just the idea of you think you might know this stuff. You don't really. I think there's a bit of that as well. You yes, know? yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think the other thing part of for me was like, you know, I'm one of these people that really, you know, there are certain books which you buy. And they're almost nutritional that you think you ought to read them because they're important, you know. But they're not necessarily that entertaining to read. And I can't, <laughs> and I kind of wanted to write something which was going to be about some pretty complex and heavy stuff, but actually for it to be quite entertaining, you know, to actually be written with a storyteller's kind of spirit, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also quite interesting because I think to try and write something that feels quite lively. And, you know, I included a couple of my teenage poems from when I was 16. Yes, yeah, I'd love and, that. And uh, somebody said, to, I included this as a footnote, somebody said, oh, do you not think that's a bit self-indulgent? I was like, it's my book. If I can't be self-indulgent in this book, when can I? So, <laughs> Where else can you do it? Print it on a t-shirt I mean? and walk yeah. around. Jeez. You know, but there's something hilarious about, you know, including poems that you wrote when you were 16. I've got diary entries from when I was a kid in there as well. But I think yeah. it's basically, my thing is that, I think it's actually quite an entertaining read as well as being informative. And I think that trying to hit the sweet spot where something is actually has, you know, cause like the books I really enjoy are things like, you know, Bill Bryson and, you know, books where you learn things, but they're actually, there's a real light touch to them, you know? And so there's a bit of me, which is sort of trying to get into that spirit as well, where you're learning stuff, but it's actually not something that you feel um, like it's hard work, that the information is not that hard to digest as well. Absolutely. And that, I think that's key in making something like this, which is or has always been perceived as inaccessible and so visibly and, and um, societally othered, accessible. And, and it, it literally is, it's not just opening a window, it's opening the entire front of the house. It's opening the entire bifold doors and going, there's a barbecue, just come over, you're invited. And it is so, so humanizing and it's so inviting as well. So what did you not know that you now know as a result of reading the book? I think it's not necessarily a case of what I did not know. What it was for me was that it reinforced things that I felt already. And therefore for me, it was, no it was nourishment. And because because these are the things that you feel and that you know if if you are from this community, if you are Pakistani Muslim already, and and um and also have married out before as well. And then there are there are, you know, so so I I'm Pakistani Muslim woman who married a Jewish man. So I've 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 done that before. And we're no longer married, but that 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 happened in our in our family. And it and culturally, it wasn't a, necessarily a problem for our family, but it was perceived in the wider in wider society as this bizarre. Oh, your zoo animals! Oh my goodness, how does that work? And I was just like, we're not specimens; we're just two nerds that fell in love with you. I don't know how to explain this to you. Please stop looking at us. Don't touch my hair. But it was just it was so bizarre. But it's um it's one of those things that it was just deeply nourishing, deeply nourishing for me, because it's you are aware already of how the world perceives you and and how that impacts you. But being an armchair warrior is 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 
is one of those things that sometimes it can be an echo chamber where where you are aware of what is happening and how it affects you but sometimes reinforcement and sometimes things like this they're not just um tools to help other people relate to your community they're also nourishing tools that help reinforce how we feel about ourselves and how we see each other they're also tools that provide kinship for each for one another and, and I say this a lot, and I've said this a lot this month, particularly with the South Asian diaspora. You know, we are from a land that has been broken apart. And so for us, belonging isn't necessarily about places. It's more about people and, and kinship and relationships and food and art and music and sound and smell and clothes, things we can touch and feel and grab and, and interpersonal relationships because those are tangible and nobody can take them away from you. And, and these things are so important to us because we come from this legacy of harm and this legacy of broken, fractured pieces. And so when you start to fold that into identity, it's such a complex thing to, to figure out on your own. And so tangible things like this, tangible things like this, and, and, and to have words reflected back to you that truly mirror who you are and truly see you. And this is our theme for the Lit Program. It's what world are we reflecting back to children? And what does this then tell them about what they can dream for themselves? It's a deliberate um intentional theme this year because it is about what what tangible things can we we create that that reflect back a sense of belonging that shows you that the truth of your history is here that you can see yourselves in these stories who you might want to love is 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 okay whoever you want to be is is implicitly accepted and wanted and belongs and it's about reinforcing belonging and so what i what i really wanted to it's a long-winded answer. I do apologize. But what I wanted I've to say about... the question, but that's fine. <laughs> but what I wanted to say about, about this was it, it, it is, it's not just for people that don't understand us. It is also for us. And it's also about kinship. And it's also about belonging in terms of seeing yourself in another. And it, is, it, it was a really nourishing read. It really was. I mean, one of the things that I was quite interested in was that my dad died when I was uh, 23 and my mum, my mum, I'm sorry to hear that. And my mum is around, but, um, you know, she's got um, Alzheimer's now. And so her memory is, is, is not what it was. Mm. And I was really interested in trying to illuminate the experiences of that generation because you know, like one of the things about, you know, what you've just talked about to some extent as well, it's about trying to work out where one's place is in the world and where one's place is in the country. And that is partly about seeing not just one's own story, but the larger mosaic and where that story fits in. And so for me, it was really fascinating to try and say, OK, well, you know, my dad's no longer around, but what would have been the experience of somebody like him getting married to somebody who he barely knew and then coming over to, to, to this country? You know, what would it be like to be 16, great, growing up in a village in Pakistan, seeing a guy who's twice your age, marrying him and then coming to a, ho a shared house in Harrow in the late 60s, you know? And so to then talk to women who are now in their 70s and say, and what was really fascinating was that there was a really... Um, I was surprised at how raw some of the things people would be talking about. So I would often ask, how did it feel to be 16 and getting married? And they'd say, I was really angry. You know, I was really angry that I wanted to go to school and I was having to get married, you know? Mm. One of the men, one of the stories that I still, I, I know so many people in the stories and there are so many extraordinary stories, but one of the things I still, I, I still have a very clear memory of hearing this woman talking about being 16 years old. I think she's, a, I think she might have been in Harrow and she's in this shared house with these six guys who all go out to work. And so she's on her own and she just sits and watches the TV all day. Her husband is working. And she told me that when she was watching the TV, she'd have to turn the TV off when she wanted to change her clothes because she thought that the TV could see back at her. Oh my God, that's so cute. <laughs> you know? And I was like, that's how, you can't make fiction up like that. Yeah. You know, that sort of telling detail. For me, that was what the book was all about. Not the generic, not the cliche, but what's the telling detail that illuminates these things, you know? And mm. then the other, and the other part is about not being afraid to ask hard questions. You know, and I think if you come from inside a community, 
you know, there's a danger that one can then get, to be honest, a sort of a instinctive defensiveness, which means that you only ever talk about the good stuff and you deny the challenges. And for me, and for me, that is not being true to the spirit of what it is to be part of a, to be a candid friend of the community. You know, I kind of wanted to say, look, you know what? The truth is, there will be things in this book that will feel uncomfortable to you, regardless of what your opening position is. If you are a sort of Guardian reading liberal, you'll probably find some stuff uncomfortable in this book. If you are a Telegraph reading conservative, there'll be stuff that will feel uncomfortable because it isn't the narrative, the truth, if you want to call it that. It's just more complex. And there are, and so I didn't want to write a book which was basically a defense of Islam. You know, mm. as in everything anybody ever says about British Muslims as critical is a load of absolute nonsense. How dare you? And I didn't want to write something that was going to be bashing Muslims either. And so I don't know what you think, but I felt like I tried to be actually ask the hard questions as well of myself, but also the, of the community, if you want to call it that, uh, from, a, from a place of support and from a place of wanting to get to a better place, but not ducking them or pretending they don't exist. Yeah, I thought you did that really, really skillfully, actually. And I think this would not have been um, a success as as a, a, as a body of work had you um, just memorialized and aggrandized the religion and 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 just said that and like you said, made a case for the defense of Islam because the the fact is that every culture, every religion has things to interrogate about it and has things to criticize about it and what I love about work like this and when I come across writers that do this so effectively is that being able to talk about the more fractious and barbed parts of the things that are part of our culture or our heritage or our religion and being able to do that in a way where you're not rubbishing your community is a very difficult line to walk but I think you do it very very effectively which brings me to chapter five um, they follow a religion that hates Jews. I wanted to ask you about the creation of this chapter. And um, first of all, what 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 compelled you to include this in the book and, and why you felt it was necessary? Not that I'm saying it wasn't, I think it is. But, um, and how you went about creating this and, and um, including everything that you did. Um, that was, to be honest, I was just doing the, uh, the, the imaginary conversation with the Islamophobe, mm. you know, I was just like trying to work out what would they say. That was part of it. The second part was I have had experience with people who have expressed what you would call either sort of is benign the right way, maybe not definitely sort of just very, very sort of baked in anti-semitism in mm. terms of what things people say and you know whether it's about people who will just literally deny that uh 9 was committed by you know uh, but that somehow that the, the jewish people were implicated in 9-11 for example or something like that you know and you know often these are taxi drivers in luton i have to say when i'm coming to see my family but um mm. it's it, it happens and I was just interested to know, and then also then you go through it, if you just Google the number of times that uh, Muslim, sometimes it often seems to be Labour councillors who, uh, who share, you know, anti-Semitic posts, et cetera, et cetera. And I just thought, well, what is it about that? And then the second part of that was that I've just grown up absolutely steeped in Jewish art, you know, in terms mm. of whether it's about you know, Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen or Steven Spielberg or Philip Roth or Woody Allen. Um, I know those two now are problematic, but I can't deny that I like their work. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I was just like, why? And then, you know, you look at obviously the the, 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 the comparisons and the similarities between the faiths. And I was just like... So oh. similar. Yeah. So, so similar. And, and I was just always baffled by why there isn't a stronger sense of kinship between the communities and the religions because there's just so much in common and and then you know you can say well actually anti-semitism is beyond is about way way more than just muslims and christians you know you, you only have to look at uh, you know 
recent events in the Labour Party, pre uh, pre the current leader for that sort of thing, etc. But I just thought I didn't want to duck anything. So that was where my starting position was. And mm. then I wanted to say, OK, well, if, this, if I'm just assuming that this is the case, is it really the case? And then you start finding out about Bradford Synagogue, which loses its roof. And it's the local Muslim community that helps fund the saving of the of the of, of the roof. Then you find out about a Muslim woman who marries a Jewish guy, not you. And then you find out <laughs> about and then you find out about the different kind of similarities and the parallels. And then you find out about a woman who gets married to a guy and then they get arrested for um, trying to bomb synagogues in Manchester. And so mm. then you get this a selection of different stories that are in that particular subject area. And then it's about trying to stitch a narrative that somehow weaves that through, you know? And so it's that, that's basically how I did it, really. I mean, it wasn't, it, it was something which I did, I, it, it didn't feel at the end of it, um, it I didn't want to write, any, I didn't want to miss anything out, you know? And mm. that was one of the things that I wanted to sort of include in that. So that, that's really, those are the sort of reasons for why I did it. It felt like it felt like a very comprehensive overview, and and I, I enjoyed it. And I think I don't think we we hear that very often. I think that it's always a very polarized uh, topic of conversation. And like you said, it's ingrained. It is an ingrained sensibility that people from this community, from our community, sometimes just have an ever so slight propensity towards. And it's like that we know that we can't date each other. We know that we can't be that close with each other or like each other. But when you get down to the bare bones of it, does anybody really know why? Because I was always raised to 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 know that I could marry anyone that was Muslim, Jewish or Christian. And that's how I was raised because that's, that those are the religions that were allowed. And, um, and so I was like, great. Okay, cool. I'll come back to you with my research. And, and that's just how it was in, in my household. And, um, I've just find it, I've always found it so bizarre. We were always, uh, we went to schools that were predominantly Jewish schools. And so we, that's how we were socialized. And, and there's so many parallels with with Islam and Judaism. And, and actually when I did get married, it just, we didn't have to change anything about our lives. In fact, I actually ended up eating more kosher meat than, than, than I ever did eat halal meat. And I was like, oh, McDonald's, boo, I miss it. But it was just, it, it, it there's so many parallels in in birth in birth traditions in death traditions in in the way that people eat in the way that people pray fasting. so many similar things fasting as well exactly um, so I mean, many one of the, parallels i mean one of the themes in the book that i did sort of pick up on was the lack of the amount of um, well how about this the lack of religious knowledge among people who say they're muslims oh god yes yeah you know 100% um, and often the certainty of their opinions in the face of actual of, of that lack of knowledge and uh, and you know and I count myself as part of that as well you know I mean I'm not I, I don't know that much and it's and doing this book has helped give me some you know knowledge and a good a good example of that is halal meat actually which I sort of discuss in the book you know like mm. I don't eat meat that's not halal and if you if you were to ask me why I would just say that's what the religion says and I'm doing it as a sort of you know, as a kind of just following, ticking the box because that's what I'm supposed to do. But mm. the number of people who told me that actually the religion is about it's about eating meat that's that's considered to be that one of the things somebody said to me was that eating food is a source of bringing communities and families and people together. And so food is meant to be something that is a bridge towards greater social interaction. And so if so, as I said, you know, when I go to my wife's parents up in Scotland, you know. And they were to offer me chicken and it's not halal, you know, am I not meant to eat it? And mm. now he's, I don't, I don't eat it. And, uh, but then this guy was talking to me, he said, well, no, because the whole point of food in Islam is to bring people together. So by not eating the food they've cooked, you are actually using food as a source of division. And you're that rejecting is, hospitality. You're rejecting hospitality. And that is a greater crime. Interesting. Than the thing. And I would never have thought that. Mm. You know, so that's an example of um, learning more about my own, you know, about my own religion. But I think there's just a lot of people who 
basically wang on about what they think the religion says without really knowing anything about it. And the more you learn about it, and even the cursory knowledge that I picked up from reading it, from, from writing the book, you just realize these things are just way more nuanced and way less binary than you think they are about almost everything. About almost everything. We were always taught that it needs to be approached as though it were an allegor allegorical philosophy and you need to read and keep reading and study it is it's something to study and and it is something that is a philosophy and if you are approaching it in a binary sense you will never understand you will yeah. never understand the true principles of what of what actually is being laid out for you which really is just be a good person do nice things be kind don't lie treat people well you know and 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 ask forgiveness when you do awful things and forgive others even when they're not sorry and and the the the, the main principles that we hold on to are the things that endure over generations over thousands and thousands of years and i think sometimes when we cluster into these puritanical little bubbles in every religion and i was saying this my mother and i were having this conversation yesterday um when we were saying how toxic that those little bubbles are and why um our faith has always been better served as a family far away from the, from the mosque and how it's just, we've, we're just happier in that sense. And I've always felt, I wouldn't necessarily say I was religious, but I feel more spiritual and, and more connected to my faith the way I am now than, the, than had, what, if I were in a mosque. One guy I spoke to up, up in Bradford, who's a teacher, he came up with such a brilliant line. He talked about how, you know, I can't remember the exact thing he said, but he said, essentially he said Islam in a way is about sort of building a house. Now, it gives you the principles of building a house, mm. but how what you build the house with depends on where you are. So if you are in the North Pole, you might build an igloo because that's appropriate for there. But if you're in sub-Saharan Africa, you might build it with entirely different materials. And he says the problem with too many Muslims in this country is they're trying to build an igloo in the desert. Oh my God, that's such a good analogy. That is exactly it. That is exactly it. You know, they're not, they are holding on to these binary ideas, mm. these sort of handed down so-called truths that are not necessarily religiously rooted. And they're not allowing, they're not, they're not enough questioning self-analysis or discussion about this. And then on the other side of that, you have to say, because of a sense that Islam and Muslims are under more attack, questioned mm. more, challenged hunker more. Hunker down, don't hunker you? Hunker down, and then you get mm. a sense of defensiveness. So there's a sort of ignorance meets defensiveness, which means that people just don't acknowledge that things sometimes have to move along, but you don't yeah. necessarily lose who you are in that moving on. My goodness. Love this. Absolutely love it. I am mindful of the time. So I wanted to ask if you'd like to do a short reading for us. Or a long yeah. reading, whatever, whatever you. Yeah, like. sure. Well, I mean, I could read. Um, it's weird to end by reading the beginning, but I thought I'll just read you the beginning <laughs> because uh, uh, this but life is, is cyclical. <laughs> so I, I wrote. Um, so there's, I think there's ten chapters, maybe nine, something like that. Um, no, there's ten chapters, but there's an the, ten, the, the book is framed around two pieces, which are about fathers. First one is about me and my father, and the second one, which is at the end, is about me as a father. So this is literally how I start the book. Um, and again, as I said, this is the first time I'm, I'm reading any of this stuff, so excuse me if I it's a bit uh, raw. I will me out of shot. Uh, prologue, Father, Part One. I am searching for my father. It's a cold, late January morning, and I am wrapped in a long black coat on a train that I boarded at London St Pancras, heading to Luton. My memories begin in this town. I was born in Pakistan, but arrived in Britain in May 1974, one month shy of my third birthday. My father, Mohammed Manzor, left Pakistan in January 1963, leaving behind his wife and two children. My older sister was one, and my older brother had been born the previous month. My father promised my mother, Rasul Bibi Manzoor, that he was only going to be away for five years. He was going to go to work and save money, and then he would return home. He did return home, but only for visits. In the 11 years my parents were apart, my father visited Pakistan three times, most significantly for me in 1970 when I was conceived. It was never a permanent return. Britain was becoming his home, 
and in the spring of 1974, it became mine. My younger sister was born the following year. We lived in Luton, where my father worked on the production line of the Vauxhall Car Factory and my mother as a seamstress at home. I went to school and college in Luton, but left first to study in Manchester and later to live and work in London. I left Luton at the age of 18. It's my past. But the past is never over. It's not even past. I get off the train and hail a taxi. The Muslim taxi driver asks me where I'm from. I tell him Luton. Yeah, but where are you really from, he asks. I stare out the window in anti and I stare out of the window in anticipation and guilt. I don't visit my father often enough. The taxi reaches its destination and I take a deep breath and step out. A light rain is falling and my footsteps are heavy as I walk towards him. I stop in front of him and say, Assalamu alaikum Babuji. Hello, Dad. The marble tombstone in front of me reads Mohammed Manzor, 1933 to 1995. My father died from a sudden and unexpected heart attack in June 1995, three days before I turned 24. He lies buried in the Vale Cemetery and Crematorium in the section reserved for the Muslim dead. Mohammed Manzor is buried as he lived among his own. My family's origins are in the villages of rural northern Pakistan. There is no record of where or when my grandparents were born and no documents that detail their lives. There are no certificates that record their births and no memorials that reveal where they are buried. The lives of my grandparents are a mystery, but the early life of my parents is scarcely more distinct. My parents married, my parents married around 1960, but there are no photographs of the wedding and my mother cannot recall the precise date. I remember as a teenager being filled with the aching envy at seeing my white friend's family albums, photographs of grandparents' weddings, grandfathers in military uniforms, and scenes of parents as small children. My father, or my friends, took these things for granted, but I was acutely aware of the impact of not seeing these images. Why do the faces in the photographs from my parents and from my father's early life in Britain haunt me? In part, it's because photographs can help flesh out and provide colour and detail to understanding our past. I stare hard at the grass under which his coffin is buried, and I swear that the ground seems to move gently up and down, as if the dead are still breathing. There is a space set aside next to my father's grave for my mother. I should come and see him more often. When my father arrived in Britain in 1963, I imagine he came filled with hopes and fears. He would not have left Pakistan unless he believed in Britain, believed that it was a land of promise. But in the year since he died, there have been many times that I have wondered how he would have felt about that promise. Was it delivered or has it been betrayed? My father died in 1995. I got married in 2010. My daughter was born in 2011 and my son joined us in 2016. This same period has also seen the rise of Islamist, of, has seen the rise of Islamist and far right extremism. There have been occasions when I have felt despondent about the times we're living in and what might be coming next. My father never lived to see me build a career. He never had the chance to meet my wife. He never lived to see a British Pakistani mayor of London, a British Pakistani chancellor of the Exchequer, a British Pakistani presenter of the Today programme, or a British feature film about a Pakistani teenager growing up in 80s Luton. He didn't witness the terror attacks in the United States on 9-11, the terror attacks in London on 7-7, the Manchester Arena bombing, the London Bridge stabbings, the rise of Islamic State, or the reports of Pakistani grooming gangs. He never lived to see fascists back on the streets of Luton. Luton is my hometown, but for many, Berry Park and Luton has long been shorthand for many of the ills associated with Muslims and multiculturalism, extremism, segregation, and a sense that Muslim-dominated neighbourhoods resemble a foreign land more than England. When I was growing up in Luton, I was raised by my parents to believe that they were different. They had different values. They had a different culture. They were a threat to our way of life and they would never accept us. They were white people. In recent years, I've heard the same accusations repeated. They are different. They have a different culture. They are a threat to our way of life. They will never accept us. But now it's far right groups such as the EDL and Britain First 
that are making these accusations and now they are Muslims. My ambition with this book is to honestly confront the fears that Muslims, the, is to honestly confront the fear that some people have about Muslims. Why do they live in segregated communities? Why do they not treat women the same as men? Why do they wear the niqab? How much should they be responsible for Islamic extremism, Islamist extremism? Why are they so overrepresented in child sex street gangs? Why don't they show more loyalty to this country? I want to write a book that is clear eyed, not rose tinted. Whatever your preconceptions and prejudices, I hope there are moments when they are challenged and you occasionally feel uncomfortable when forced to confront what you thought you believed. This book is for anyone who is interested in knowing why we became so divided and how we might yet become more united. You are not a drop in the ocean, wrote Rumi. You are the entire ocean in a drop. It's impossible for any individual story to represent the entirety of the British Muslim experience, but I believe that human stories of hope and love and rage and loss can reveal a greater story. It's easier to make sweeping generalizations about others if we know next to nothing about them, if they remain an abstraction. But if we move forward, we need to reverse the process to start rehumanizing those who have been dehumanized, and for that we need the art of storytelling. And this is a story in which my father, my family and I are all characters. It's my contribution to that effort of rehumanizing, of trying to build a bridge of empathy and understanding. When Muslims and non-Muslims see the other as they, the danger is that they stop seeing each other as individuals, with each side dehumanizing the other. At times, it has been tempting to succumb to hopelessness, to accept that the divisions are too wide to bridge, but I can't yield to despair. As the father of two young children, I have to believe that a better future is reachable, to believe that Britain can still be a promised land. So my ambition for this book is that it reveals a story that is ultimately inspiring, optimistic and hopeful, as it illuminates a path that helps lead us from they to us. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. That was incredible. So when is your book out? Um, it is out on August the 19th, which is on Thursday. I think you can pre-order. In fact, you know you can pre-order. Um, Taking all if my you, sticky tabs. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, there is a link um, on the biog, which has like a different options where you could buy it. And by the way, the real cover, because you've got the proof cover, the real cover. Yes, I, I do. See yeah. it, it, this has, is they. And then in Urdu, oh, it says... Great. In Urdu, it says Vorlog, which is sort of those people. Because I quite like the idea of having a bit of Urdu um, on, on the cover. So there you go. Love that. That's great. Um, and you can follow Safraz at Safraz Mansour on Twitter and Instagram as well. And we Yeah, and on, on Instagram as well, yeah. We just have comments coming in saying, so true that I didn't pop up earlier. And then clappy hands. That was lovely. Um, oh, cool. Thank you so much for your time. This was This was a truly nourishing nourishing session it was really really lovely well you are talking to me in the very room that i wrote the book so uh so it's oh, kind of nice love that. yeah oh, yeah no it's quite it's, it's very weird it's you know i spent a year in lockdown sitting here whilst my wife was uh trying to help look after the kids and it was all obviously an insane insane time and so you pour everything you can into this room trying to tell a story and you've got nobody you can speak to because you're at home the whole time and you're just thinking is this any good i don't know i just is any of this interesting? Will anyone really care? Um, am I saying anything fresh? And then, so it's weird to sort of, that was only last year, now to have a solid book. And then at some point in the next couple of days, mm. real live people are going to start having opinions on it. And then it becomes not just about me. But it feels nice to have managed to at least do something during that crazy last year. It's great. And I can't believe it's just the culmination of a year in lockdown. It's extraordinary. It really, really is. Absolutely extraordinary. Oh, before we go as well, what's your favourite Bruce Springsteen song? Um, there's a song called The Promise, and it has a lyric in it which says, I hit it big once, I hit it big once, but I paid a big cost. Inside I carry the broken spirits of all the other ones who lost. And um, for me, carrying the broken spirits of all the other ones who lost has been something which I've tried to do in my own small way in my writing. 
That's lovely. Um, incidentally, to follow on from Donna's comment here, are you narrating the audiobook for this? I am. Yeah. And also Smashing. it's book, uh, I, uh, it's book of the week on Radio 4 um, starting on the 23rd. So the week after. Brilliant. Um, and I narrated that as well. And that was a very emotional experience. Interestingly, there's a, the section where I was starting to talk about my wedding. I actually broke down and started really? crying quite badly. And they had to stop recording. Well, they, they sort of interrupted the recording. And then I said to the producer, you should use it because that is really powerful. But she said it. I sounded so broken. <laughs> That they did think it would be, they thought it would be too upsetting for listeners, so that so they so they're not including that. Oh bless you. Um yeah. it's a testament to just how how much you lay on the page, really. It's incredible stuff. It really is. Well, thank you for reading it. And um I hope everyone who's been listening has has uh well, firstly I hope they've enjoyed it, but secondly, I hope it's it's temp it's tempted them to want to buy the book. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a it's a it's a must read. It really is, and I will be uh, picking up the audiobook copy as well. I find something very very powerful, particularly in hearing um, writers from our community narrate their own work and 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 read their own work aloud. And it's it's something. It's, there's a lot of magic and alchemy there. I think in in just speaking your own words. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just feel like it's about it's your story. So one has to sort of. It'd be weird to let somebody absolutely. else read. The, somebody else read it you know absolutely well unless it was brian blessed because he can just read anything <laughs> yes <laughs> he can read the back of a cereal box and i'd be happy yeah. right okay i shall not take up any more of your time thank you so much thank you so much for um for this afternoon and thank you so much for everybody that has tuned in as well we can see you all and and i'm glad that you've enjoyed it and and best of luck with everything this is an extraordinary piece of work and yes please do keep in touch with us and we will we will keep retweeting and, and promoting things yeah. where we can well, and i'd love if you could check back in with us with south asian writers i'd love to do do something again with you soon this has been wonderful yeah. well thank you for inviting me and it's nice to be able to do something inside it's interestingly my daughter she was studying uh, she was having black history month and she said why isn't there a brown history month and uh, she was a bit confused so i was quite glad to know that this thing exists Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, we launched it in Parliament in 2019 and now it will be part of British history every single year throughout July and August and ending on the anniversary of partition. And we're working yeah. towards partition education as well. So we'll get there. We will get there. And we're in year two now and year three will be even bigger and even better. So I can't I can't I can't wait for it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your time. Goodbye, everyone. And happy South Asian Heritage Month. We shall see you later. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.